Welcome back to the second lecture on chemical process design. What I would like to do in this part of lecture two is introduce you to a handful of reactor design embodiments that are well suited for gas liquid processes, where either the gas flow dominates the liquid flow or vice versa. All too often when designing reactor systems for the first time, I have seen students fall into the trap of thinking too narrowly about either plug flow reactors or stirred tank reactors. Whilst these mechanical embodiments can be used in some circumstances for certain single and multi-phase systems, they are by no means the only physical embodiment of systems that may act as a plug flow reactor or a stirred tank reactor at the design and simulation stage. I'd also like to remind you about the importance of reactor hydraulics in two-phase systems, and we're going to do that by taking an excursion into the Peak District one very windy day in October. Let's start by thinking about mass transfer between phases. If you've got a two-phase system, we can think about the mass flux of species from one phase to another being governed by a mass transfer coefficient, the total area of interface through which those species pass, and also a concentration driving force. And so if we increase any one of those three terms, the concentration gradient, the mass transfer coefficient, or the total area, then we can increase the mass transfer rate. So when we come to think about designing mechanical systems, let's think about increasing one of those things to start with, and that is the total interface area. The more interface we have, the more material can pass through it for a given mass transfer coefficient and for a given concentration gradient. So if we've got a gas liquid system, how can we do this? Well, here on the whiteboard is one idea for you. If you have liquid being sprayed into a tower at the top, and you have gas coming into a tower at the bottom, rising upwards, then so long as that spray process ensures you've got nice small liquid droplets, for a given volumetric flow rate, you might have millions of liquid droplets, hence a very large surface area of gas liquid interface. And so spray towers can sometimes be used when your gas flow dominates your liquid flow. Now, of course, if we think about this, we've got to be somewhat careful about that gas velocity, because if it's too high, it's simply going to blow the liquid up the column, which we don't want to do. And so to decrease the gas velocity for a given volumetric flow rate, you just make the column of a larger diameter, and it'll bring your superficial velocity down to something that won't end up sending all your liquid droplets upwards. Now, of course, a spray tower is not the only embodiment by which we can get a nice large surface area between gas and liquid phase. We've achieved it in a spray tower by making liquid droplets, but there's no reason why we can't make gas droplets, which are sometimes known as bubbles. So if you think back to distillation, what does distillation do? It transfers mass between two phases. You transfer more volatile and least volatile components between your gas and your liquid phases, depending where you are in a tower. So why not take that concept, and convert it into a reactor? If, for example, you assume that you've got complete conversion on each of these liquid pools, these trays, then maybe each of these trays can be modeled as a stirred tank reactor. And you've got stirred tanks in series. And if you've got enough stirred tanks in series, it starts to look like a plug flow reactor, of course. So if we zoom in on one of these trays, let's see what's going on. Let's assume we've got a sieve tray, which is basically a big perforated plate. And that big perforated plate has a rim on it such that it holds back a liquid pool. That rim is called the weir, of course. So in operation, you've got gas going up through the holes in the base of the plate, bubbling into the liquid, making many, many, many hundreds of thousands of bubbles, which, of course, gives you interphase surface area. And of course, the more bubbles you have, the more surface area you have, the more mass transfer you're going to have. Now, trade towers or sieve trade towers can suffer from some shortcomings, because if you think about the static head of liquid on one of these plates, if there's not enough gas pressure going upwards to overcome rho GH, the liquid is just going to drain through the holes in the plate. But of course, we know from distillation systems that there are ways around this, and you just design more cunning plates, for example, bubble caps or valve trays. So if, for example, you're trying to dissolve a soluble gas into a liquid, and a very good example of this is carbon dioxide scrubbing into, say, an amine solvent, a trade embodiment of a reactive scrubber could be a very good way of doing this. And again, you determine your hydraulics by varying your tower diameter. 
Again, if we think to distillation, we know that it's not just trays that can be used. We can get packed columns, and we're going to be talking about trade columns and packed columns later on in this course as well. Now, if we think about what's going on when we've got a packed column, we've got a different situation occurring. What you have is a means of promoting liquid films over a very large surface area, which is your packing. And so you get liquid distributed over the top of your packing, draining down through your packing in almost laminar flow liquid films, very, very thin liquid films with very, very large surface area, and gas flowing upwards through that packing such that it is in contact with that liquid film. So you've got a nice large liquid surface area, thanks to those films. It's in contact with the gas phase, and so hence you've got a large interphase mass transfer area. And again, these columns can suffer from hydraulic problems such as flooding, and if your superficial gas velocity is simply too high, make your column wider, drop your superficial gas velocity down. So these three design embodiments, your spray tower, your trade tower, and your packed tower, are very good for systems what we term low liquid holdup. That's where your volumetric liquid flow is a lot less than your volumetric gas flow. All through these three systems, we've said we need to be careful with flooding. That is, if your gas velocity is greater than your liquid velocity. Now, sometimes it's very useful to have a mental picture of what we mean by flooding. So let's go and take that walk into the Peak District on a windy day. And where we're going to go is a place called Kinder Scout. And as you can see in this film, Kinder Scout's got a nice waterfall. But when you get an absolutely howling gale in from the southeast, the waterfall blows back on itself. And this is what flooding is. That waterfall is constantly recirculating. And if you imagine this is happening in a column with your gas velocity blasting your liquid out of the top, this is the thing to avoid. So, column flooding basically means your gas velocity is too high, make your column wider, bring your gas velocity down, allow your liquid droplets to fall, and allow your gas to rise without it blowing the liquid out of the top of the column. Don't create kinder downfall in your own piece of design work. Let's think about the reverse scenario. Let's think about systems where we have high liquid holdup, where we've got far greater liquid flow now than we have gas flow. And one simple design embodiment here is to take our spray tower and effectively turn it upside down. Rather than spraying in liquid at the top with a glorified shower head, let's just bubble gas in at the bottom. So here we have a bubble column. And we're creating surface area by sparging, spraying in gas. So I'm sparging in gas at the base of the column through a very, very large area. And hopefully what we make are many hundreds of thousands of small, tiny bubbles that just rise through the system at a residence time determined by their rise velocity. And hopefully you end up with a large gas liquid surface area, hence a large mass transfer area. Now, there's a slight problem because from a hydraulic standpoint, if you've got lots of bubbles rising as a bubble swarm, Sometimes they come into contact with one another and they coalesce and become a slightly bigger bubble. And if too many bubbles coalesce, of course, you're losing surface area, which we don't want to do. So from an abstracted point of view, what we'd like to do is introduce bubbles into a column and a means of preventing coalescence. So one way in which we can do that is by making the bubbles flow around a packed system. Try and just keep them segregated. This isn't going to be perfect because bubbles might just accumulate at the stagnation points of the various parts of the packing and then they just might form hollow gas voids and they might just sit there um, whilst the liquid flows around it. So again, that may not be appropriate. It depends on your gas flows. It depends on your packing design. But what we might decide to do in the end is introduce a slightly more active system to keep our bubbles apart. And we might introduce some kinds of liquid agitation. And the idea here is if our liquid flow pattern is sufficiently strong, then our gas may not be able to meet each other. So because our gas rise velocities might be low compared to our liquid velocities. Another advantage of systems that have a mechanical means of agitation such as this is that the extension and shear rates in the liquid phase around that agitation system may be strong enough to actually break bubbles up. And so what you might find is that due to this agitation, you're actually increasing your bubble surface area. And that's a quite a nice side effect because yet again, that allows you to increase your mass transfer area.
On the minor side, however, you've now got a more complex system. And remember what we said at the outset, aim for simplicity. Simplicity is elegant. Here we've got more complexity because we've got a mechanical stirrer. We've got some kind of mechanical seal around the shaft where that shaft comes out of the pressure vessel. And then you've got all the drive equipment. So motors and gearboxes and motor speed controllers for the agitator. Depending on the chemical environment into which the stirrer is placed, it might also be subject over time to corrosion. So this isn't a simple solution. It might be effective, but there might be a better way of doing it that is indeed simpler in its own way. Remember the uh, deep shaft process where we introduced circulation patterns by just having a geometry of a reaction system that would allow sufficient static head and density differences to develop and get a natural circulation pattern going, hence avoiding any need to have mechanical seals for rotational equipment. So let's recap a few key points from this section. There can sometimes be differences between how you model a reactor and what its physical embodiment look like. So think of that trade tower. Each tray effectively was acting like a CSTR. You had many trays in, se in series, so that effectively made the entire piece of equipment look kind of like a plug flow reactor. But if we look at the design of it mechanically, it looks nothing like a plug flow reactor. It might act like a plug flow reactor, but its mechanical embodiment is very, very different. So start to get used to drawing a distinction between how you might model something and how something might appear to perform from a theoretical standpoint and how it's actually designed and built. For gas liquid reactions with low liquid holdup, we've seen spray towers, trade towers and packed towers as appropriate physical embodiments. These are by no means the only ways you can do this. This is a non-exhaustive list. These are just design ideas for you to take and then maybe to develop further. For gas liquid reactions with high liquid holdup, bubble columns, packed bubble columns and maybe bubbling circulating tanks might also be appropriate physical embodiments. Again, they're not the only embodiments of such systems. So, key point, when you're dealing with two-phase flows, particularly gas liquid flows, good hydraulic design is essential. Remember that video of Kinder Downfall in the winter? Don't end up with column flooding. <laughs>